call it Stormy Monday. But Tuesday's just as bad. They call it Stormy Monday. But Tuesday's just as bad. Wednesday is worse. Thursday is oh so sad. Now, let me make it clear in the beginning that I see this war as an unjust, evil, and futile war. I preach to you today on the war in Vietnam because my conscience leaves me with no other choice. The time has come for America to hear the truth about this tragic war. In international conflicts, the truth is hard to come by because most nations are deceived about themselves. Rationalizations and the incessant search for scapegoats are the psychological cataracts that blind us to our sins. But the day has passed for superficial patriotism. He who lives with untruth lives in spiritual slavery. Freedom is still the bonus we receive for knowing the truth. Ye shall know the truth, says Jesus, and the truth shall set you free. Now, I've chosen to preach about the war in Vietnam because I agree with Dante, that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who, in a period of moral crisis, maintain their neutrality. There comes a time when silence becomes betrayal. Good afternoon. I'm Laura Walker, President and CEO of uh, WNYC Radio. Um, thank you. And thank you all for being here. Those words that you just heard were the beginning of a sermon that Dr. King gave at the Riverside Church in April of 1967. And uh, this sermon had a great impact on the nation and also on me because I, as a nine-year-old, was in the, in the congregation at that historic address. Um, it's really my great pleasure to welcome you all here uh, tonight, today, for the annual celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I would like, first of all, to thank our colleagues at Civic Frame and the Brooklyn Museum um, for their terrific partnership, and I think you're really going to enjoy uh, the panel. It's an extraordinary panel. Um, today's theme, which is re-examining the radical ideas of Martin Luther King, is particularly close to my heart because this memorable sermon was one of a series of controversial addresses King delivered against the role of the United States in Vietnam. On April 4, 1967, Dr. King took an uncompromising stand against the Vietnam War in a speech to a meeting of concerned clergy at Riverside. That speech rocked the nation and unleashed a storm of backlash in the press. Three weeks later, on April 30th, Dr. King delivered his anti-war message again from the pulpit at Riverside as a, at a sermon during a Sunday service. My family belonged to Riverside. It was very active in Riverside. And on that morning, um, my parents uh, pulled me out of Sunday school, which I knew had to be a really important occasion, um, to go to church. Um, but even at nine years old, I really felt the excitement, the buzz, and the sense of historic occasion. The sermon was called, Why I Am Opposed to the Vietnam War. I remember very, very distinctly sitting up on the second balcony, for those of you who know Riverside, it was, I was way up on the second balcony, watching this man from far away preach from the pulpit. I could feel the powerful, powerful presence. I could hear his magnificent voice and the cadences and the beauty of his speech. But most of all, I sensed the deep sense of conviction. And even at nine, I could tell what he was doing was calling all of us to join him in a really important, to take a really, really important stand. I understood all that back then. I didn't understand, I think, 
that this sermon, that this speech, really was a turning point for him and really defined him in many ways as the radical king. Um, one year later, of course, to the day of the April 4th address, Dr. King was assassinated and we were all shaken. Martin Luther King's words continue to resound in the American conscience. This celebration today embodies WNYC's mission to be a catalyst for democracy and civic dis discourse, to deeply engage with our communities, and to be a meeting place for the American conversation, a forum for ideas that challenge, inform, inspire, and uplift. Thank you for joining us today to consider Dr. King's impact on our world. Like many other things in our communities, the quality of the public conversation is sometimes lacking. Oftentimes when uh, they herald something as a public conversation, they bring out one speaker, said speaker or expert presents his or her opinion, and the audience is supposed to ask questions. Well, that oftentimes leaves the community just where it was before the speaker got there. Sometimes when they have uh, two speakers presenting supposedly both sides, you get diametric opposition, an argument, combat with words. Well, that kind of conversation leaves people feeling unfulfilled, like the actual issues haven't been grappled with. Um, then we have sometimes the traveling or the itinerant speakers who go into communities and just step in and step out quickly. But again, this leaves the quality of public conversation right, very low. And a lacking public conversation erodes the quality of democratic discourse and democratic living. Realizing then that the quality of public conversation was low and that communities need to have discursive space to work through issues that are important for those communities' survival and vital for their sustenance, about 10 years ago, April Yvonne Garrett began to think about a new way of having conversations in communities, a way that would respect the local, but also bring in outsiders. So she thought of a way to combine local expertise, artists, preachers, speakers, teachers, with experts who are nationally known and who work on these issues from outside of the community. This mode of conversation has grown into what we now call civic frame. As a board member of Civic Frame, I want to acknowledge other board members present and to welcome you all. I want to thank uh, WNYC and the Brooklyn Museum for allowing us to partner with you. Our aim is to forge relationships with local communities to help them raise issues, sustain conversations on these issues, form plans, and make corrections. We recognize that the way to correct things requires touching hearts and minds appreciating people where they are and growing with them, compromising and being firm, being pushed and pushing, gaining and losing. It is this artistic struggle as we celebrate the radical legacy of Martin King that guides the vision of Civic Frame. And I want to, again, welcome you all and say thank you for coming out and taking your time on a Sunday, uh, showing up early at the Brooklyn Museum. We greatly appreciate it and welcome you from Civic Frame. Thank you. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Sackler, and I am on the board of the Brooklyn Museum. And on behalf of the board and the staff of the Brooklyn Museum, I'd like to welcome you. I'd like to welcome WNYC and Civic Frame in what is a wonderful partnership. And to say how proud the Brooklyn Museum is to be hosting this important panel discussion, uh, embracing the radical legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. The Brooklyn Museum is very proud of its diverse audiences, of our wonderful African-American uh, uh, exhibitions and collections, and it's a real delight to have everyone here this afternoon. For me, it's been a personal honor to have been invited to welcome you all here and to welcome WNYC and Civic Frame. I came of age um, hearing Dr. King's glorious voice, hearing his ideas, hearing his goals, and ringing in my ears 
is that voice calling all of us, calling me to join in the march to freedom? And we did join, and I did join. And that was 40 years ago. I heard, in addition to all of the marvelous speeches of Dr. King's, on Wednesday, April 3rd, in Memphis, Tennessee, Dr. King's reminder to his people that the purse, the power of their purse, calling on an economic boycott would cut to the heart of all matters. Calling an economic boycott of major corporations would cut to the heart of all matters. I heard the following day on Thursday, April 4th, 1968, the gunshots that silenced that voice and those calls. Martin Luther King's vision, his ideas, and his ideals that he held up for this country are what today keep my hope alive. And it's only continuing to march, to demand, to boycott, in fact, to do whatever we have to do that we will reach a world of equality and justice and freedom, which is becoming more and more de de dear. And we need deep and transformational social change. So I thank co-hosts Brian Lear and April Yvonne Garrett, and I thank you all for coming and celebrating the 40th anniversary, this tribute, this remembrance, and this reminder. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. I know you can do better than that. You know, I went to Harvard Divinity School, so I'm from this call and response tradition. I know you know about that, so I'm going to try it again. Ready? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, that's so much better. I am April Yvonne Garrett, founder and president of Civic Frame. And I am Brian Lehrer, host of The Brian Lehrer Show on WNYC. Thank you all so much for coming. It is with great pleasure that Civic Frame partners with WNYC Radio and the Brooklyn Museum to present this program honoring the legacy of the Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. It is fitting that this partnership illuminates the core values of the Civic Frame mission, to use art and intellectual work to encourage civic engagement, media literacy, and critical thinking about social issues. When WNYC approached me about partnering in this effort, I was adamant in my belief that we should not produce a program that reduces Dr. King to a disembodied, watered-down caricature that is often used today for commercial gain. In fact, my friend Troy Johnson, a talk show radio host in Baltimore, just informed me of a most egregious example of this misappropriation. It was a promotion for a nightclub. It proclaimed, free at last, Free at last. Ladies, finally free. Midnight at last. Instead, we have worked to present a program befitting a king and a queen as we also honor the importance of a great sister freedom fighter in the beautiful and dignified Coretta Scott King. Today, we have already been encouraged by our young people to look beyond our own time and consider their futures. Now, we will be enlightened by four thoughtful scholars who were chosen specifically to contextualize Dr. King's more radical views. They will illuminate his legacy as a political strategist, social ethicist, pu public economist, and cultural critic. We will also be inspired by two artists who will use their poetic gifts to convey their passion for justice and their respect for Dr. King's enduring legacy. By the conclusion of this event, we hope that you will have a greater understanding of the King legacy in its own context 
and have considered how he might respond to today's pressing social issues and also be inspired to tackle a few pressing social issues that are near and dear to you. Thank you, April. Uh, I met April for the first time about two hours ago, but I feel like I've known her for decades. We've been partnering on the phone with our respective organizations for the last few months, and there is such um, a simpatico mission between our organization and their organization that it's just been a delight to work with April, and we look forward to today, and I hope things be on today. Now, first of all, take a look around. Look at all these people who you don't know, just like I didn't know April till two hours ago, who came out in the cold today to connect with something real, something important, something meaningful. Each of you could be home right now watching football and eating chips. <laughs> so let's start by giving your neighbors here a round of applause just for showing up and filling this room. Community. Community is possible, progress is possible, connection is possible. Showing it just by showing up today is great evidence. Now, as April was saying, we will build the next 90 minutes or so around Dr. King's own words. You'll see actor Thaddeus Daniels reading quotes from Dr. King to launch four short 15 minute or so panel meditations on Dr. Martin Luther King as political strategist, as social ethicist, as public economist, and as cultural critic. We'll hear from poets, and we do have microphones on the floor, left, right, and up, for your participation. And when we get to those points in the program, of course, we ask and we trust that you will be brief out of respect to your fellow audience members. The topic for today is embracing the radical king, prophetic or passé, which means to me two big questions. One, was king more radical than most history portrays? And two, if so, does that leave him more or less relevant for today? Did you know that exactly four months to the day before he was killed, and Dr. Sackler mentioned the Poor People's Campaign at its end, four months to the day before April 4th, 1968, Dr. King held a news conference to announce his Poor People's Campaign. And he was asked by a journalist, it seems from what you have said here that this movement seems to have a more militant tone about it. Would you say that this is going to be a more militant movement than ever before? And King's response was, I would say that this will be a move that will be consciously designed to develop massive dislocation. I think this is absolutely necessary at this point. It will be massive dislocation without destroying life or property. And we have found through experience, through our experience, that timid supplications for justice will not solve the problem. We've got to massively confront the power structure. So this is a move to dramatize the situation, channelize the very legitimate and understandable rage of the ghetto, and we, knew, we know we can't do it with something weak. It has to be strong, dramatic, and attention-getting. Well, some of those words, like massive dislocation, are not the ones that are generally associated with Dr. King, but there they were. So let's embrace the radical king this afternoon. On the website, commondreams.org, Stephen Zunes wrote, perhaps it was no accident that he was murdered not during his campaign to end segregation, but when he began to challenge the foundations of American capitalism, militarism, and imperialism. In a sense, King's right-wing critics were more on target than many of his liberal supporters, he writes. King was a radical. King was never a communist. His deep religious faith made any adherence to the material values of Marxist-Leninism impossible. He was, however, a democratic socialist, a Christian socialist, who firmly believed that meeting the basic needs of the poor was a higher priority than ensuring profit for the few. And even on King's nonviolence, Zunes writes to King, nonviolence was actually more radical, again using that word, than violence which simply perpetuated the oppression of one group against the other. He believed that nonviolence was not a just tactic, not just a tactic, nor was it just a personal ethos. It was both. This gave King, like Mohandas Gandhi, the stature of being both a great moral leader and brilliant political strategist, which actually leads us right to our first topic after we introduce the members of our panel. 
Our wonderful panel includes Trisha Rose, Professor of Africana Studies at Brown University. And Corey D.B. Walker, Assistant Professor of Religion and Philosophy in the Department of Africana Studies at Brown University. Patricia J. Williams, Professor of Law, Columbia University. And Eric Gregory, Professor of Religion at Princeton University. And now, Martin Luther King as political strategist. In a multiracial society, no group can make it alone. It is a myth to believe that the Irish, the Italians, and the Jews rose to power through separatism. Their group unity was always enlarged by joining in alliances with other groups, such as political machines and trade unions. Our primary respondent to that first reading, and forgive me folks, I need to hear my producers in my headphones, so I'm going to sit here with headphones on and look like radio guy, <laughs> which April doesn't have to do, and of course our guests don't have to do, but our, the primary respondent, and then we'll have a short panel discussion, uh, to that quote and this idea of Dr. King as political strategist is Patricia Williams from Columbia, who, by the way, some of you may know, is the writer of the Mad Law Professor column in The Nation magazine. Thanks. Um, would, would you like me to read all three of these first, or do I? Did um, you want to read a couple of other quotes, or did you want to react to that I'll one? React Your to that choice. One. I'll react to that one. Um, I'm sorry. I, uh, the, uh, Martin Luther King is a political strategist. Um, I think would have. Uh, responded in a way that focused attention on the question of voting power much in the same way that it was a central issue in his day, so it is a central issue today. I think he would have focused on the question of the persuasive power of the media in today's world. Um, and I think that he would have taken his notion of coalition and as he had begun to toward the end of his life, made an, an issue in our vastly globalized world. Uh, Martin Luther King, I think, also would have been dealing with the strange conundrum of what it means to proceed from a core um, of the politics of oppression by race at a time where politics demands that one be unraced. And I think he would have been fascinated to be confronted and be dealing with the uh, phenomenon of a man like Barack Obama who is to some extent both liberated but also trapped as an unraced race man. Um, <laughs> now um, in terms of when I try to imagine what he would be strategizing around in today's world, um, I see him and what he has and what he would be doing now is very different from the colorblind champion um, to which he so often flattened. Um, I try to imagine where he would be having his nonviolent uh, protests and marches. And just imagining that um, makes him much more radical than I see anything happening in today's world right now. I imagine that he would be on the front wars of the immigration crisis. He would not permit the African American community to be divided between Latinos and African Americans. Um, he would see the common bond in that fate. He would be protesting the walls. He would be climbing those walls um, even as they are built. I imagine that he would be marching with lawyers in Pakistan um, against Musharraf and our own mini Musharraf here. I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> that he would be side by side um, in the very complicated, admittedly twisted politics of the Middle East, but he might be side by side with somebody like Rachel Corey. Um, he would not let the provincialism of our domestic politics 
um, prevent us from seeing the commonality or limiting it um, to the fact that we are, you know, with the disasters that we have close at hand. I th imagine that he would see the post-traumatic stress syndrome of the soldiers coming back who are on the front page of today's New York Times and connect that, link that, with the post-traumatic stress syndrome suffered by generations of inner city black kids with no access to education, um, comfort in the face of the vast violence that has devastated our community. And I imagine he would resist the kind of finger shaking, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, um, to which those forlorn, desolate youngsters are too often condemned. Professor Williams, let me follow up, because a lot of that has to do with Dr. King as political philosopher and mm -hmm. where he might come down on various issues. Mm -hmm. um, as political strategist, there was, of course, all the news in the last couple of weeks about Hillary Clinton's comment that Martin Luther King, uh, that uh, Martin Luther King needed Lyndon Johnson in order to yes. get the Civil yeah. Rights Act passed. Um, we found a clip of him actually in a phone conversation with President Johnson in 1965. Um, strategizing on the Voting Rights Act, which got passed later that year. Yeah. We pa played on, on Friday. And the role that King played in that phone conversation was political strategist. He was saying to Johnson, you know, if you get a lot more African Americans to vote, they're only 40 percent registered now in the southern states that you lost in 1964, you're going to stand a better chance of re-election, mm -hmm. is in effect what he was saying. So I wonder if you could talk about how King historically built some of those coalitions and how he might go about doing it today in this horribly divided world that we have. Well, I think that he would be not just a political strategist. To this, at the, at, at, all of that is necessary in terms of going into the dark rooms or the back rooms, the smoke-filled rooms, and persuading presidents one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but I also think he would have to be a media strategist in today's world. And I think he'd have to be a technological strategist, because I think that voting rights um, is so amplified in its crisis by, uh, the, by, the, by the specter of voting machines, um, both metaphorically and possibly quite literally owned by, uh, by major Republican donors or by one party or the other in he, any event. He was a master at coalition building. Yes. And, you know, even you mentioned um, Rachel Corey. He spoke very sympathetically about Israel in mm -hmm. his life. Yes. I wonder yes. if he might have had a strategy to help bridge that gap. Or looking at the results of the Nevada primary yesterday, Nevada caucuses, 80% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. of the African American vote went to Barack Obama, 75% of the Latino vote went to Hillary Clinton. There's a big division. Yeah, and I do think that there's also, I mean, there, there's, <laughs> that's why I think that he would have to be a media strategist even more than a political strategist in today's world. Um, the, um, the power of um, the sort of the, the, the snarky little whine of the Rush Limbaugh, excuse me, am I permitted to say that, but, 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 but on, um, <laughs> uh, on so many media outlets, uh, the, the present company notwithstanding, I mean, a lot of that is drowned out by the, uh, uh, by, by those voices like, like, like middle schoolers with distemper, you know, the, 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 the um, and, and fed, their scripts fed, um, the more insidious part, fed by expert linguists and r rhetoricians um, who take small sound, sound bites, repeat them over and over and over again on mass channels, um, distorting meaning and distorting meaning and distorting meaning until it becomes taken as truth. And I think that that's one of the, um, the greatest uh, enemies that, that, that he probably didn't have to face in that time, that he was silver-tongued, but that that silver-tongue doesn't have the same power if, in fact, you can frame it. I saw Bill Clinton on the news, news the other day. I saw Obama the other day on the news today. And you saw both of their heads with their mouths moving while breathless Nancy Grace-type voices were saying, and you know what, they blew their top and then they, had a, they, they were raving and they were ranting, um, and they were not permitted to speak. And I think that the degree to which the media has been, become much more sophisticated about framing anyone um, as an entree or an access or as, persuas as, 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 as persuasive powers in this world um, is a major problem. You are prophetic because we're going to have Professor Rose actually address that point mm -hmm. toward the end of the program. But I wanted to give, uh, go back to a question about legal context and, and his, his uh, power as a legal strategist. Um, the late Judge A. Leon Higginbotham in the introduction to In the Matter of Color 
spoke about the death of King and how President Johnson summoned him and his, a host of his other counselors to help him craft a response to the tragedy. And in the midst of the collective solutions that they were trying to come up with, the judge pondered how the American legal process actually contributed to King's ultimate demise. However, in spite of what Higginbotham you know, sort of documents historically as you know, a hostile tendency of the American legal process towards African American agency, King was gifted at understanding the reach and the limitations of the law. And yes. I wanted to ask you if you think today's leaders have a lesser, equal, or greater understanding of the law, and if so, can their strategies be as successful? Yes, I think that King was enormously talented in wedding a kind of theological discourse and rhetoric and making it a legal case. I mean, he was never unconscious, although he did not argue as a lawyer, he was never unconscious of arguing within a legal system. The civil rights movement was a legal movement. Right. Um, the, the, and, and one of the things that I think that Barack Obama has been so gifted at, and I think that perhaps uh, the top three candidates, including um, uh, Hillary Clinton and John Edwards, they have been able to proceed against a legal backdrop. Now, the thing that worries me about all of this is that we have a resurgence of a shadow legal system. We have our constitution on the one hand, um, which we, to which we bow down and we, and we, and we, and we consider hallowed. We have, on the, at the same, by the same token, what I call the anti-constitution, which is the USA Patriot Act. Um, and the, to the degree that that affects all dissidents or dissent or people who, th who, who can be construed as vaguely threatening, um, then it opens a complete door to the suspension of all due process. Um, and that suspension is something that I don't think the American public has gotten a real handle on in terms of its shadow or secondary, the, the effects of it as a sh shadow or secondary legal system, um, whether we, we're talking about Guantanamo Bay, whether we're talking about the ease with which suddenly, even in American law schools, we're discussing whether torture shouldn't be a, a, a kind of, um, not even last ditch recourse, but a preventive, preemptive kind of torture. Um, and I do think that the degree to which we have strayed from even the legitimate legal system that was in place, as conservative as it might have been in that case, he was not arguing within a system that simultaneously legitimized, um, for example, the, the, you know, the lynching system or the Jim Crow separate secret um, uh, 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 lack of due process by which blacks were thrown into the rivers. Um, but instead, we are dealing quite openly as a country um, with, uh, with, 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 with camps whereby people can be disappeared, not have access to lawyers, not be told of the charges against them, not be permitted to confront and cross-examine witnesses. Um, I think Martin Luther King would be at the forefront of concern about that. And can, I think... Can, go, very, very, go ahead and finish up very briefly, yeah. then we want to get some quick reactions from the other panelists before we go on to our and, next quote. And all I want to say is that's before we even get to the problems with our current legal system, with the criminalization of whole populations, with the packed court um, uh, uh, from the Supreme Court, but most people are not aware of how completely packed the federal bench beneath the Supreme Court is. Um, that's before uh, uh, we get to um, the, the question of the surveillance laws that have gone into place um, as well. Who wants to jump in? Patricia Rose. <laughs> the other, the other Tricia. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I think I think what's so crucial here is uh, the the post 1975 transformation of the public sphere, because I think what you're identifying here is the sort of seamless way that these massive changes that should result in extraordinary public vigorous conversation happen while the public sphere itself has been reduced and contained and controlled in precisely the ways uh, you've described. So that um, the, the sort of corporatization of the public sphere through mass media and entertainment, the idea that news is fundamentally entertainment, and if it's not entertaining, well, then I guess it's not news, um, has created an incredible uh, illiteracy, really, about what, I mean, so this isn't really only about our people uh, uh, cynical in the face of it. It's also a sheer lack of information, which is achieved. It's not just a random byproduct. So that's, that, that moment is very important. Just one comment also, picking up on the theme of strategist. The thing I think about King's courage and imagination is he was willing to transcend uh, 
what the operatives thought should be his audience or what the media would frame his story as, and he would appeal directly, for example, to white moderate ministers. And using a language that resonated with him, he didn't think, well, this isn't my audience. He was mm. willing to transcend whatever the, uh, the script others were willing to write he should be doing. Mm. I think King's challenge as a political strategist is never to lose the context of the human being. So King forces us to look at humanity, not through a bland humanity of who we are or what some abstract collective. King focuses, focuses us to look at the very particular people that we are. So King never puts a dichotomy, a false racial di either race or class. It's not by accident, King would remind us, that so many African Americans and people of color are at the lower ends of our economic stratum. That's not an accident. That is, uh, uh, that is part of a historical legacy. And King forces us to look at that historical legacy and all of its ugliness and all of its painfulness and yet look at it in all of its promising beauty. As a strategist, you have to look at the painful, the ugly, that which hurts in order to see the beauty of a possibility of a new day. That's what King challenges us to do. If we don't think of political strategy in that manner, then we can begin to articulate change without challenge. Mm. And that becomes the very evacuation of politics. Mm. Thank you, Professor Walker. And Professor Gregory, when you talk about building those coalitions along race and class lines, you remind me of a quote that I happened to reread over the weekend from Martin Luther King's 1957 speech called Give Us the Ballot, in which he reached out to various groups. And this, this really stuck with me. He wrote, a second area in which there is a need for strong leadership is from white northern liberals. There is a dire need today for a liberalism which is truly liberal. What we are witnessing today in so many northern communities is a sort of quasi-liberal, which is based on the principle of looking sympathetically at all sides. We call for a liberalism from the North which will be thoroughly committed to the ideal of racial, racial justice and will not be deterred by the propaganda and subtle words of those who say, slow up for a while, you're pushing too fast. So he had a lot of reaching out to do and he worked hard to do it. And I think that'll conclude the first quote and response from Dr. King. Now we will consider King as a social ethicist. Now, we've got to get this thing right. What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love.
cold and stormy Monday. But Tuesday's just as bad. They call it stormy Monday. But Tuesday's just as bad. Wednesday is worse. Our primary respondent to that first reading, and forgive me folks, I need to hear my producers in my headphones, so I'm going to sit here with headphones on and look like radio guy, <laughs> which April doesn't have to do, and of course our guests don't have to do, but our, the primary respondent, and then we'll have a short panel discussion, uh, to that quote and this idea of Dr. King as political strategist is Patricia Williams from Columbia, who by the way, some of you may know, is the writer of the Mad Law Professor column in The Nation magazine. Um, would, would you like me to read all three of these first, or do I... Did um, you want to read a couple of other quotes, or did you want to react to that I'll one? React Your to choice. That, I'll react to that one. Um, I'm sorry. I, uh, the, uh, Martin Luther King as political strategist, um, I think, would have uh, responded in a way that focused attention on the question of voting power much in the same way that it was a central issue in his day, so it is a central issue today. I think he would have focused on the question of the persuasive power of the media in today's world. Um, and I think that he would have taken his notion of coalition and as he had begun to toward the end of his life, made an, an issue in our vastly globalized world. Uh, Martin Luther King, I think, also would have been dealing with the strange conundrum of what it means to proceed from a core um, of the politics of oppression by race at a time where politics demands that one be unraced. And I think he would have been fascinated to be confronted and be dealing with the uh, phenomenon of a man like Barack Obama who is to some extent both liberated but also trapped as an unraced race man. Um, <laughs> now, um, in terms of, when I try to imagine what he would be strategizing around in today's world, um, I see him and what he has, and what he would be doing now is very different from the colorblind champion um, to which he so often flattened. Um, I try to imagine where he would be having his nonviolent uh, protests and marches, and just imagining that um, makes him much more radical than I see anything happening in today's world right now. I imagine that he would be on the front wars of the immigration crisis. He would not permit the African American community to be divided between Latinos and African Americans. Um, he would see the common bond in that fate. He would be protesting the walls. He would be climbing those walls um, even as they are built. I imagine that he would be marching with lawyers in Pakistan um, against Musharraf and our own mini Musharraf here. I imagine <laughs> that, <laughs> that he would be side by side um, in the very complicated, admittedly twisted politics of the Middle East, but he might be side by side with somebody like Rachel Corey. Um, he would not let the provincialism of our domestic politics um, prevent us from seeing the commonality or limiting it um, to the fact that we are, you know, with the disasters that we have close at hand. I th imagine that he would see the post-traumatic stress syndrome of the soldiers coming back who are on the front page of today's New York Times and connect that, link that with the post-traumatic stress syndrome suffered by generations of inner city black kids with no access to education. Um, comfort in the face of the vast violence that has devastated our community. And I imagine he would resist the kind of finger shaking, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, um, to which those forlorn, desolate youngsters are too often condemned. Professor Williams, let me follow up, because a lot of that has to do with Dr. King as political philosopher mm -hmm. and where he might come down on various issues. Mm -hmm. um, as political strategist, 
There was, of course, all the news in the last couple of weeks about Hillary Clinton's comment that Martin Luther King, uh, that uh, Martin Luther King needed Lyndon Johnson in order to yes. get the Civil yeah. Rights Act passed. Um, we found a clip of him actually in a phone conversation with President Johnson in 1965, um, strategizing on the Voting Rights Act, which got passed later that year. Yeah. We pa played on, on Friday. And the role that King played in that phone conversation was political strategist. He was saying to Johnson, you know, if you get a lot more African Americans to vote, there are only 40% registered now in the southern states that you lost in 1964, you're going to stand a better chance of re-election, mm -hmm. is in effect what he was saying. So I wonder if you could talk about how King historically built some of those coalitions and how he might go about doing it today in this horribly divided world that we have. Well, I think that he would be not just a political strategist. At the, at the, at, 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 all of that is necessary in terms of going into the dark rooms or the back rooms, the smoke-filled rooms, and persuading presidents one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but I also think he would have to be a media strategist in today's world. And I think he'd have to be a technological strategist, because I think that voting rights um, is so amplified in its crisis by, uh, the, by, the, by the specter of voting machines, um, both metaphorically and possibly quite literally owned by uh, by major Republican donors or by one party or the other in he, any event. He was a master at coalition building. Yes. And, you know, even you mentioned um, Rachel Corey. He spoke very sympathetically about Israel in mm -hmm. his life. Yes. I wonder yes. if he might have had a strategy to help bridge that gap. Or looking at the results of the Nevada primary yesterday, Nevada caucuses, 80% mm -hmm. of the African-American vote went to Barack Obama. 75% of the Latino vote went to Hillary Clinton. There's a big division. Yeah, and I do think that there's also, I mean, there, there's, <laughs> that's why I think that he would have to be a media strategist even more than a political strategist in today's world. Um, the, um, the power of um, the sort of the, the, the snarky little line of the Rush Limbaugh, excuse me, am I permitted to say that, but, 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 but on, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, on so many media outlets, uh, the, the present company notwithstanding, I mean, a lot of that is drowned out by the uh, uh, by by those voices like 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 middle schoolers with distemper, you know the the, the, the um, and and fed their scripts fed um, the more serious part fed by expert linguists and re rhetoricians um, who take small sound bites, repeat them over and over and over again on mass channels, um, distorting meaning and distorting meaning and distorting meaning until it becomes taken as truth. And I think that that's one of the um, the greatest uh, enemies that, that, that he probably didn't have to face in that time, that he was silver-tongued, but that that silver tongue doesn't have the same power if, in fact, you can frame it. I saw Bill Clinton on the news, news the other day. I saw Obama the other day on the news today. And you saw both of their heads with their mouths moving while breathless Nancy Grace type voices were saying, and you know what, they blew their top and then they, had a f they, they were raving and they were ranting. Um, and they were not permitted to speak. And I think that the degree to which the media has been, become much more sophisticated about framing anyone um, as an entree or an access or as, persuas as, 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 as persuasive powers in this world um, is a major problem. You are prophetic because we're going to have Professor Rose actually address that point mm -hmm. toward the end of the program. But I wanted to give, uh, go back to a question about legal context and, and his, his uh, power as a legal strategist. Um, the late Judge A. Leon Higginbotham in the introduction to In the Matter of Color spoke about the death of King and how President Johnson summoned him and his, a host of his other counselors to help him craft a response to the tragedy. And in the midst of the collective solutions that they were trying to come up with, the judge pondered how the American legal process actually contributed to King's ultimate demise. However, in spite of what Higginbotham, you know, sort of documents historically as, you know, a hostile tendency of the American legal process towards African American agency, King was gifted at understanding the reach and the limitations of the law. And I wanted to ask you if you think today's leaders have a lesser, equal, or greater understanding of the law, and if so, can their strategies be as successful? Yes, I think that King was enormously talented in wedding a kind of theological discourse and rhetoric and making it a legal case. I mean, he was never unconscious, although he did not argue as a lawyer, he was never 
unconscious of arguing within a legal system. The civil rights movement was a legal movement. Um, the, the, and, and one of the things that I think that Barack Obama has been so gifted at, and I think that perhaps uh, the top three candidates, including um, uh, Hillary Clinton and John Edwards, they have been able to proceed against a legal backdrop. Now, the thing that worries me about all of this is that we have a resurgence of a shadow legal system. We have our constitution on the one hand, um, which we to which we bow down and we and we and we and we consider hallowed. We have on the at the same by the same token, what I call the anti-constitution, which is the USA Patriot Act, um, and the, to the degree that that affects all dissidents or dissent or people who, th who, who can be construed as vaguely threatening, um, then it opens a complete door to the suspension of all due process. Um, and that suspension is something that I don't think the American public has gotten a real handle on in terms of its shadow or secondary, the, the effects of it as a sh shadow or secondary legal system um, whether we, we're talking about Guantanamo Bay, whether we're talking about the ease with which suddenly, even in American law schools, we're discussing whether torture shouldn't be a, a, a kind of, um, not even last ditch recourse, but a preventive, preemptive kind of torture. Um, and I do think that the degree to which we have strayed from even the legitimate legal system that was in place, as conservative as it might have been in that case, he was not arguing within a system that simultaneously legitimized, um, for example, the the, you know, the lynching system or the Jim Crow separate secret um, uh, 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 lack of due process by which blacks were thrown into the rivers. Um, but instead, we are dealing quite openly as a country um, with, uh, with, 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 with camps whereby people can be disappeared, not have access to lawyers, not be told of the charges against them, not be permitted to confront and cross-examine witnesses. Um, I think Martin Luther King would be at the forefront of concern about that. And can, I think... Can, go, very, very, go ahead and finish up very yeah. briefly, then we want to get some quick reactions from the other panelists before we go on to our and, next quote. And all I want to say is that's before we even get to the problems with our current legal system, with the criminalization of whole populations, with the packed court um, uh, uh, m uh, from the Supreme Court, but most people are not aware of how completely packed the federal bench beneath the Supreme Court is. Um, that's before... Uh, uh, we get to um, the, the question of the surveillance laws that have gone into place um, as well. Who wants to jump in? Patricia Rose. <laughs> the, other, the other Tricia. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I think what's so crucial here is uh, the, the post-1975 transformation of the public sphere, because I think what you're identifying here is the sort of seamless way that these massive changes that should result in extraordinary public vigorous conversation happen while the public sphere itself has been reduced and contained and controlled in precisely the ways uh, you've described. So that um, the, the sort of corporatization of the public sphere through mass media and entertainment, the idea that news is fundamentally entertainment, and if it's not entertaining, well, then I guess it's not news, um, has created an incredible uh, illiteracy, really, about what, I mean, so this isn't really only about our people uh, uh, cynical in the face of it, it's also a sheer lack of information, which is achieved. It's not just a random byproduct. So that's, that, that moment is very important. Just one comment also, picking up on the theme of strategist. The thing I think about King's courage and imagination is he was willing to transcend uh, what the operatives thought should be his audience or what the media would frame his story as, and he would appeal directly, for example, to white moderate ministers and using a language that resonated with him, he didn't think, well, this isn't my audience. He was mm. willing to transcend whatever the, uh, the script others were willing to write he should be doing. Mm. I think King's challenge as a political strategist is never to lose the context of the human being. So King forces us to look at humanity, not through a bland humanity of who we are or what some abstract collective, King focuses, uh, focuses us to look at the very particular people that we are. Mm -hmm. So King never puts a dichotomy, a false racial dichotomy, either race or class. It's not by accident, King would remind us, that so many African Americans and people of color are at the lower ends of our economic stratum. That's not an accident. That is, uh, uh, that is part of a historical legacy. 
And King forces us to look at that historical legacy and all of its ugliness and all of its painfulness and yet look at it in all of its promising beauty. As a strategist, you have to look at the painful, the ugly, that which hurts in order to see the beauty of a possibility of a new day. That's what King challenges us to do. If we don't think of political strategy in that manner, then we can begin to articulate change without challenge. Mm. And that becomes the very evacuation of politics. Mm. Thank you, Professor Walker. And Professor Gregory, when you talk about building those coalitions along race and class lines, you remind me of a quote that I happened to reread over the weekend from Martin Luther King's 1957 speech called Give Us the Ballot, in which he reached out to various groups. And this, this really stuck with me. He wrote, a second area in which there is a need for strong leadership is from white northern liberals. There is a dire need today for a liberalism which is truly liberal. What we are witnessing today in so many northern communities is a sort of quasi-liberal, which is based on the principle of looking sympathetically at all sides. We call for a liberalism from the north, which will be thoroughly committed to the ideal of racial, racial justice and will not be deterred by the propaganda and subtle words of those who say, slow up for a while, you're pushing too fast. So he had a lot of reaching out to do, and he worked hard to do it. And I think that'll conclude the first quote and response from Dr. King. Now we will consider King as a social ethicist. Now, we've got to get this thing right. What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love.
call it Stormy Monday. But Tuesday's just as bad. They call it Stormy Monday. But Tuesday's just as bad. Wednesday is worse. Professor Gregory, the late theologian James Melvin Washington, a leading authority on Dr. King and American religious history scholar, described King as a great prophet who provided discipline, calmness, reason, and hope in the face of death threats and ominous signs of disillusionment within the African American community. We ask you to consider King as a social ethicist. Can you speak to how King's integrated understanding of religion, philosophy, and politics gave him the audacity to stand for faith, hope, and justice? I want to make two brief points about the radical King in terms of social ethics and religion. I don't think they're themselves very radical points but I'm struck how often they're neglected in our celebrations of King, so I thought I'd elevate them. The first point is King was a Christian. Uh, it's a surprising fact that a number of my Princeton undergraduates failed to know or appreciate. He was embedded in the black church and the memory of the people that the black church embodies. King claimed he was fundamentally a Baptist preacher. The civil rights movement was a legal movement, but it was also a church movement. The Christian content of King's vision, I don't think, should be overlooked. Okay, to be sure, King represents an incredible mix of traditions, Gandhian nonviolence, the black church, liberal Protestantism, and American democracy. Okay, I don't want to elevate his religious faith to the neglect of his other parts of his identity. King didn't have to be unraced to be a Christian. And King never used his Christian faith to mock or ridicule those who did not share it. He didn't use his Christian faith to exclude anyone from the American promise, as we see, I think, today in our current election process, when Christianity is invoked as a vague trump card to woo adherents through identity politics. King was raised in a fundamentalist tradition, but he came to believe that personal piety and social justice didn't need to conflict with each other. In fact, there's a necessary relationship for King. So his gospel that we heard about was social and personal. Some of you may remember when George W. Bush was asked who his favorite political philosopher was. And he said, Jesus, why? Because he changed my heart. Now, I don't want to question the authenticity of that claim. <laughs> that wasn't meant to be a joke, but thank you. <laughs> but I think the remarkable and, in fact, radical part about King was he talked about Jesus changing hearts but also paying attention to structures of society, and a Jesus who paid attention to the abused, the weak, the outsiders of history. Now, many people today think religion, it's very radical to oppose religion in the name of democracy or to oppose democracy in the name of religion. One prominent philosopher says the problem is for every one king, you get 10 Pat Robertsons. I think part of the genius of King was able to root his commitment to freedom and equality within a, a story of grace, God-given rights, redemptive suffering, in a way that sustained the civil rights movement and also gave him an independence of spirit. Okay. He was a Christian, but he was able to talk about values in ways that transcended religious and political divides. Just one brief second point. I think that aspect of King's capacity to transcend his own particular tradition without denying it is important for us. King didn't separate compassion of Christianity from social justice. He didn't allow the appeal to personal charity to neglect structures and institutions of injustice. That's very radical. He knew that public institutions and law mattered, and he knew that the habits and the hearts of a democratic people mattered. And King's love that we heard about stood against Western arrogance. It stood against and saw Vietnam as a symptom of a deep national crisis, what he called the giant triplets of racism, militarism, and materialism. King's love stood against the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth created by capitalist practices. He saw segregation as an economic system for cheap labor. King's love stood against white moderates who 
were more devoted to order than justice. King's love stood against the hubris of American exceptionalism. What does that mean for today? I think this love today should stand against a highly punitive criminal justice system where the percentage of African Americans in prison is approaching levels of Russians in Stalin's gulags. King's love should stand against global poverty where 80% of the wealth belongs to a rich few. And that glaring disparity often is a proxy for political inequality, political si uh, silence and disempowerment. King's love should stand against vicious homophobia, discrimination, hypocrisy in high places, torture and executions in dark places, religious bigotry, bigotry in all sorts of sacred places. Let me end with one quote that I happen to think of as one of the most radical messages of King. Some think it's condescending, some think it's weak, some think it's an Uncle Tom sign of false consciousness, but I think it's one of the most sublime moments of King. Since the white man's personality is greatly distorted by segregation and his soul is greatly scarred, he needs the love of the Negro. Thank you. Now, the other panelists are gonna to react to that and then in a few minutes, maybe five minutes or so, we're gonna to start to include your voices. If you wanna to react to anything you've been hearing up here, give some of your own thoughts. We're gonna ask everybody to, as we would on the radio, keep it to about a minute's worth of your thoughts just to let as many people get a shot as possible or to ask a follow-up question of our wonderful panel, anything that they have said that makes you curious, that makes you want to ask a question of them, you can do that too. So you can line up at the nearest microphone to you if there's anything that you know you'd like to say or ask, down that aisle, down that aisle, and up in the balcony, and we'll get to you in just a minute. And again, we ask for that respect in terms of length of time uh, so that we can get many voices in. April? Panelists? It's, it's very interesting to me when the last quote, which is, indeed sublime when one thinks about it, because it is a call to uh, a, a, a kind of shared um, um, politics of love. And at the same time, what flashed in my mind, as you said it, um, was the degree to which every politician, um, except the leading black contender, um, needs a cotillion, a flotilla, rather, of, of, of black people to love them. I mean, there is nobody... <laughs> on the political sphere right now who has not appeared with a classroom full of little black children, all of whom are trying very hard, um, or who doesn't go to a black church and preach on Sunday morning, preach their hearts out. But only um, on the Democratic side. Pardon, pardon me? Only on the Democratic side. Well, not necessarily only on the Democratic side. I mean, uh, with the exception of, of Rudolph Giuliani, who appears to go to opera on Sunday on Sundays. But, <laughs> but, um, but certainly, I think that every politician has certainly showed up in a church at one time or another, or showed up with a black religious leader, or held hands, even if it's with Clarence Thomas, um, on the subject of a church. And it seems to me that that really, that that, that image of um, being loved by um, um, in, in, in some integrated way is part of the appeal um, to which white politicians appeal for their, for their ethical credos, so to speak, um, for their ethical creds, rather. Um, where a black politician doing that, particularly an unraced race politician, um, you know, it's, it's the moment he appears with Oprah Winfrey, suddenly he's the forward phalanx of a, of a, of a, of a black agenda. Um, and, you know, if, if then his wife gets on the stage, then it, it, it might be called a riot. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> I think we've got to leave. I think Eric wanted to respond. No. I think there are cheap appeals to love and there are strategic politically appeals to surrounding oneself with African Americans. I think King, his appeal to love, as Professor Walker mentioned, was to recognize not just the extension of rights and dignity, but the humanity of all people. And part of his profound capacity to transform American culture was not just paying attention to a very narrow understanding of politics, but recognizing the deep wellsprings of American democracy that he could combine with 
without replacing it with his religious faith. Right. It seems to me that there isn't a need, I mean, we can talk about the candidates, uh, current uh, political climate in terms of the necessity of love uh, for, for black folk or for the downtrodden. But it seems to me that there's something very pernicious floating around in our political sphere. And that is the mobilization of religious arrogance for voting and for political power. And all of the candidates have, have fallen uh, prey to this disease. All of them have begun to uh, place their religious bona fides as, their, uh, as a calling card for them to enter into the realms of power. And yet, all of them, not one of them, have embraced what King has said around militarism, around the viciousness of capitalism, and around the need to change our total society. So in many ways, the religion that King was talking about is an inconvenient religion. It is a religion that challenges not only the systems that be, but it challenges our very understanding of who we are. And it is that religion, the religion that King preached, that forced him to move from uh, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church to marching with the sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee. I don't see that religion in any of the candidates. And it bothers me tremendously when religious, religion is invoked as another card, as another character trait, or as another uh, aspect of who individuals are that makes them fit to hold power. I think we need less religion and more humanity in this world. Let's go around the room, this side. Hello. I don't think that mic is on in the house, is it? It is? OK. Um, we actually, this was referenced earlier, and you were just talking about religion. And you said briefly that uh, Martin Luther King was first and foremost, or at his heart, he was a Baptist preacher. And in the age where, as you said, religion is invoked as a trump card, and people like Pat Robertson come under fire all the time for delivering political messages from the pulpit, was there a tension within Dr. King through these notions of that he's preaching and at the same time he's delivering messages against the Vietnam War, he's delivering messages against social injustice, and as far as we can deduce how might he feel today about the current trend of mixing politics and religion, regardless of whether or not he would have agreed with their message, the message that's often being preached today. Was that for Dr. Walker? That is for whoever wants to answer. Uh, uh, King has, uh, if we think about Martin Luther King and we think about the uh, black freedom struggles of the 50s and 60s, we begin to realize that Dr. King was fighting uh, a, number of, a number of ideas of religion in the political sphere. Remember, when he wrote his letter from the Birmingham City Jail, he was addressing white churchmen who felt that King was moving a bit too fast that the civil rights movement was going uh, not only too fast, but was asking too much. King felt that religion impelled him to act in a certain way in society because human dignity was being violated. And that human dignity of African Americans being violated has a historical dimension. So King wanted us to begin to face up not only to history, but to our failures, uh, uh, but up to the failures of the democratic project. Today, King would rail against the democratic deficit in American democracy. King would not be the one who says, oh, we have American democracy and we've ju we just have a little ways to go. King would say, because of our militarism, because of our rampant capitalism, because of our massive imbalance in terms of those who have power and those who are powerless, we have a tremendous democratic deficit, and that impales us to challenge not only religious voices, but voices of so-called secular leaders who articulate their, uh, the 
surety of their positions with a religious vigor that can match any preacher. And that becomes the critical issue. How do we match those who speak with secular vocabulary, secular languages, but with the authority of Almighty God? If we have yet to find that particular language, if we don't stand up to that challenge, and if we continue to worry about though, just those religious voices, then I think we would continue to have a tremendous democratic deficit, not only in the US, but throughout the entire world. Very briefly, Eric Gregory. Picking up on what Professor Walker said, I think that most people, when they say that they don't like mixing religion and politics, it's just when it's not their religion that gets mixed with politics. I think we're at a state where theists should stop talking so much about other people's morality and atheists should stop talking about how irrational theists are. And I think what King wanted was there's no second class citizens. Speak from where you come from, but speak to political issues. We don't need to have a theological concord and determine what America believes, but to follow the vision of King is to, to see the ways in which his religious faith motivated concern for freedom and equality. Let's go upstairs for another question. Hi, my name is Darrell, and first I want to thank Mr. Lair for his contribution in the civic discourse. Thank you so and much. My question is, um, in regards, I was wanted to talk back to the guest on your show this week when he spoke, uh, he wrote an article in the Washington Post about black leaders and Barack Obama. Um, and today I look at today's black leaders and a lot of them kind of align themselves with the establishment rather than challenging it and kind of relegate themselves to being sort of a mouthpiece for black America. And I wanted to know, do you think that Martin Luther King would be able to resist that temptation? Mm. Patricia Williams, do you? Yeah. Um, I do think that he would be resisting that temptation. And again, this goes back to, I think, what was just being said about the melding of his theological message into his understanding of his political activity. And at the heart, somebody mentioned the word dignity, and at the heart of what he argued for was a sen sense of not just individual and not just community or identity politics, not just national politics, but human dignity. Um, in the law, as a technical matter, um, our civil rights under recent interpretations is moving far and farther and farther away from um, that notion, whereas the growing body of international human rights law is premised, is premised explicitly on the matter of dignity. Um, and as our current administration has attempted to sever um, our commitment and our allegiance to the principles of the Geneva Conventions, for example, of the Nuremberg Court decisions and practices um, that give due process even to those whom we may despise, um, we have moved farther and farther away from that um, humanitarian core of what, he, of what he stood for. So that's why I do envision that he would be radical today. He Pat would resist that temptation. Patricia Rose, mm -hmm. let me bring you in on this. And, and reflect on, you know, when the question I asked about Dr. King and being inside or outside the power establishment, I look around at the endorsements, even in the Democratic primary, that some of his allies from his day mm -hmm. are making. John Lewis has endorsed Hillary Clinton. Andrew Young has endorsed Hillary Clinton. Jesse Jackson has uh, endorsed Obama but been critical and ambivalent about him, even got into a little public dust up with his own son, Jesse Jackson Jr., about Obama. Charles Rangel has endorsed Obama. Al Sharpton has not endorsed anybody. And so another generation, I realize, but yeah, yeah. someone who says he's, you know, yeah. from an, an heir to King. Um, maybe uh, this list suggests that Martin Luther King would be a Hillary Clinton supporter today. Well, I mean, I think, I think what's beneath uh, the question um, that uh, one of our audience members asked is, this, is the problem of the seduction of the contemporary sort of media culture and the, the idea that celebrification uh, and power are required for success. And so that, the question isn't really would, if, would King be in this state of mind had he been asleep for, say, 30 years and woke back up. <laughs> the question is what, what, in what, what calculations and what transformations might take place in him as they have in everyone else as we participate in this cultural moment. So I think the real issue, I think, is not whether or not the King we love and know would capitulate, but in what way can we take the legacy of King in this historical moment and bring into existence the kind of leadership that has enough distance
from this? And I think that's actually a much harder question. And I think there's a lot of, among the, the, the political figures you've named, a lot of jockeying, a lot of strategizing, a lot of least of, uh, least of all evils political a activity. I mean, you know, there's a tremendous amount of cynicism. And this goes to Eric's really important point about what kind of love he's talking about. I mean, I think it's a very interesting word that's very difficult to talk about in public. Um, the the, the, the uh, commercial culture has turned it into an incredibly a saccharine, cavity-filling form of romantic love that makes anyone who's thinking carefully roll their eyes back. Um, but that, that's not the kind of love he's talking about at all. And I think it's very important that we see um, that process um, as fighting a certain kind of cynicism, which is at the heart of our contemporary political project. Yeah, let me, Real short. I, I would like to say, uh, I would like to add, King would be with the over 15,000 individuals who assembled together at the U.S. Social Forum in Atlanta this past June. That's where King would be. King would endorse that radical agenda. What was that radical agenda? That radical agenda was for an evisceration of capitalism, a new form of solidarity with the World Social Forum and all of the adherence to new forms of organizing, a increased radicalization of democracy, not only within the U.S., but globally, and a uh, transformation of global capitalism such that individuals in the South do not have to continue to pay so much of their money to the North. So hold that thought because we're going to come to a quarter of the program where mm -hmm. you're the primary respondent on the question of King as public economist. So we will come back to that in greater depth. Let's hear from another audience member. All right. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like also to thank the organizers and the panelists for this really illuminating and uplifting discourse, and certainly uh, to honor Dr. Dr. King's magnificent legacy in this way. My question kind of builds on this last notion of where would King be uh, today, uh, given that no matter whether he supported an, uh, Barack Obama or not, one could only assume that he would either be sought for some counsel and advice or would be there at the ready to offer some kind of counsel advice um, being an advisor, let's say, to Barack Obama. In your opinion, what kind of advice, what kind of counsel would Dr. King give to a Barack Obama today as, from the point of view of strategist, as ethicist, Again, coming from that deep spiritual base and that philosophical base, what, what would he give? What could he give to Obama? Or what would you want him to give to a Barack Obama today? Either way, wherever you want to take it. And any member, Dr. Walker, you were beginning to do some of that, but anybody, any of the panelists at all, please. I would, I'll begin. I'll, I'll, I'll step out there. I think the counsel that King can give Barack Obama is, Tell Barack, you can't be all things to all people. Barack, you have to stand in some very uncomfortable positions. Barack, if you believe this, if you believe deep in your heart what you are arguing, then maybe this office at this time is not what's needed. Maybe we need you to develop a movement that is beyond politics, that transforms the very nature of what we think is the political. In many ways, the dust up around Lyndon, around Lyndon Johnson and the Civil Rights Movement is an argument around how we view democratic politics today. And it is a very elite argument because it is an argument of insiders and not an argument of the people. If we begin to challenge the very structures of democracy, if we develop a broad-based social movement that places pressure not only on the formal structures of democracy, but also organize our communities for, radically different, for a radically different future, then we can begin to imagine what a beloved community is about. It is Barack, challenge us and challenge yourself to change this world. Not through an, a rhetoric that gives credence to an increased militarization, not through a rhetoric that doesn't advocate, that doesn't advocate and advance universal health care, 
not to a rhetoric that doesn't empower workers, but to a rhetoric that genuinely reflects human dignity and the variety of human personality wherever it may be, not only in the U.S., but globally. Now, that's an awesome strategy. That's a, stra that's a dream strategy. But you know what? Dreams change the world. As June Jordan once said, we are the people we've been waiting for. That's the message that Barack has to give us. Well, I completely agree with that. I also think that it's almost unfair to make Barack Obama almost imagistically the inheritor of the Martin Luther King message, um, that I think there's room for him to be a democratic front runner presidential. We need that. We also need a movement leader, which is more what Martin Luther King was. Um, and part of the concern I have is that as difficult as it is to be the first black candidate or first black president of the United States, um, it is just as difficult, and I think that we need the base in order to have both, um, it is just as difficult to get a black movement, a beloved community in today's world, both where the African American community is so diverse, where our American demographics, regardless of race, are so much more diverse and different than they were, but where the attempt to to engage in any kind of group politics, not just coalition politics, but to have a community that begins at the grassroots is derided as identity politics or derided as, um, as, as, as self-centered or narcissistic or segregationist. I mean, it, it's very confusing. And I think that that's, 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 you know, we don't need to put all of those expectations on Barack Obama just because in some ways he sort of, he, 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 he does sort of channel for many of us an image of what Martin Luther King must have wanted um, if he were alive today. And now, ladies and gentlemen, poet Danny Simmons, listen. I think I must be the first Brooklyn Museum board member to be up here reading poetry. So. <laughs> uh, this is from my recent book, I Dreamed My People Were Calling But Couldn't Find My Way Home. And I thought a poem called The Jigaboo Waltz would be appropriate. I was then, as now, a challenge mostly to myself, an artist or a poet, the means needing to fit my ending as it laid before me, creeping up my back like a haunting. <clears throat> I'm called to the old grim house, through gray doors into the wheat belts, cotton fields of haunted me, America. The ski slopes of New England, get it New England where so many wars and hurts were born, old England nigger free except for proper British Negroes, whose gaze I meet each day in Bedford Stuyvesant, Harlem passing stiff back and sexless. The women trying to ride, hide, Round swaying behinds, leaving them in the commons of Ivy League universities in the hands of our oppressors, cut firmly in their two-handed strong grip, back to cursing me somebody who ain't gonna hear this poem, played reruns for those thinking my words clever or cute, leaving me bitter and gentle, ready for a gentle caress. I just saw a poet's dope fiend movie and wanted a bag to hide in, my poems to hide in, my courage of conviction stopped short by powders and praise. My only task to effortlessly mock the rushing demons, to be the butt of a critic's pen, and dance when the jig is called, that Negro jig called the Jigaboo Waltz. Dance nightly on UPN by peoples less funny than the history of oppression, less funny than so many homeless and witless refugees dropped in tatters on these shores. I want to hide myself inside of you, have you swallow me whole, then drop me out, healed and not so very hungry. From my window, outside, outside is obscured by years of soot, I see silhouettes of hazy men walk by, crippled, dragging body parts behind them, found like the burden found in existential books, existing in some European paradigm without hope or horizon, without drums or my witch doctor. I easily fall prey to bouts of despair, as prescribed by the most recent rantings of the West's greatest minds. I seek sort of salvation in a waltz turned inside out, a grease paint dance, a jig so powerful, a jig dance to the music of poverty and hate, to the civil of bacon and aroma of pork chops frying in the skillet. I get me loose and foot free and dives head first into the jiggable walls. 
Captain, boy, sir, would you please tear me down from my soot-covered window and have not my feet to fail me now? I want to dance until this despair and wet denied burdens fades into happy feet, into a wide toothy grin, into a waltz to be remembered. It seemed many other warriors would rather somber reflection and angry retrospect to battle the beast, assail his bald hide with small caliber bullets, annoying inflicting some small measure of pain, quickly fixed with iodine in the patch, the curse, the cure is biting at the wound, leaving this cancer that spreads the earth and tied her with barbs and dragged her down, said something like that there by another poet drug dead some 30 years or more. Loud and ineffective as stolen planes laying low tall buildings, clouds of human ash and pain, more iodine and more ethnic cleansing called a war on terror. I've always been terrified of you and your wars, <coughs> excuse me, and your flesh rotting diseases, your Bobby dolls and G.I. Joes forced to sex by little American boys and girls. Blonde Barbie's legs have been known to pop off getting hoisted into position. I've always felt the effects of your terror. I heard my poems are emotional, that I moat my feelings about all I've been force fed here and your books that absent me from history that tell me I began with slavery and was set free into this riding abyss to dance the jiggable waltz and re-impeat and reinvent shuffling along into the darker now. We sit pompous on flattened asses as judges, soldiers, and concubine advisors and other black-faced pirates riding the ocean of disease that engulf my people, that feed my so very deep wounds, that leave me more, so much more than emotional. So only this pen keeps the gun from my head, or better yet, yours. Or better still, you're just born to crack a privileged babies. Wait, hold on, I ain't mean to say that, sir. I just gets me confused, sir. I ain't mean that there. Sir, you want to see me dance? I dance is real, real fine for you and Missy over there. Catch my act on Broadway. Ain't no cheap tickets just like you like it, mister. Nah, sir, this pen just got out of hand. Really, sir, I do that jiggle balls just right. I ain't mean nothing bad about your babies. I think she said it just right. Miss Scarlett, I don't know nothing about birth and no babies. We ain't changed, sir. We still got them happy foots ready when you need them. And I whisper and I walk and shuffle the jiggable walls away, crack ass cracker, without even a hint of a smile, holding my gun cocked and close under my tatters. It's late and my poem seems a little long. Not as long as I watch your foot cutting off the air to so many peoples across the globe, your boot pressed tightly to their throats. But this poem and me grows tired of hurling, hurling crudely configured words at you and me locked together in this symbiosis of pain. Top dog and underdog used before, but not quite to our effect. Our history is only cycles, and now yours rushes to its end, burned out in its infancy. Not the 10,000 African years of magic and science. Your wars and your savagery are your legacy, and your patience, your science conceived of impatience. There will be a short death in the scheme of things. My pen long silent is my anger, a scratching of the scabs of the many wounds as you leave, a few for my feet. I waltz that final jiggable moment or pulling my gun. And as my foots tap loudly on slick and wooden floors, I can't find my open mouth. And anyway, my gun misfires and leaves me to crumple down in sadness that I endure with you these bouts of despair and terror, these final moments of our foolish pleasures. As I reach to you and you join me as always on the killing floor for our turn at the Jigaboo Waltz. Thank you. Uh, I think WNYC bought some copies of these, and they have them somewhere for sale. I'm not quite sure where, but OK. Danny Simmons, thank you very much.
call it Stormy Monday. But Tuesday's just as bad. They call it Stormy Monday. But Tuesday's just as bad. Wednesday is worse. But there are some things in our social system to which all of us ought to be maladjusted. I never intend to adjust myself to the evils of segregation and the crippling effects of discrimination. I never intend to adjust myself to the inequalities of an economic system which takes necessities from the masses to give luxuries to the classes. I never intend to become adjusted to the madness of militarism, and the self-defeating method of physical violence. Our primary respondent on Dr. King as public economist is Dr. Walker. Thank you. Now that he is safely dead, let us praise him, build monuments to his glory, sing hosannas to his name. Dead men make such convenient heroes. They cannot rise to challenge the images we would fashion from their lives. And besides, it is easier to build monuments than to make a better world. These words penned by Carl Wendell Himes, Jr. in 1969 eloquently depict the challenge we have if we begin to think of King as the public economist. King challenges not only our comfort levels, the comfort to be able to sit in this room with a nice clothing and a nice heated space. King challenges the very fabric of our society, a society where the rich continue to exploit the poor, a society where economics becomes the entree to political power, it's quite interesting, we're in a moment where if you don't raise $100 million, you're not a viable candidate for the presidency of the United States. I can remember as a 24-year-old, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed college grad attempting to, run for public, attempting to run for statewide office in the state of Virginia and told by the money makers that I would need $50,000 for a small seat in Virginia. It seems that money, not principle, forces us to engage in a political system that gives us all the mask of disseminating democracy, but all too often continuing to engage in the, pil the pilfering of the poor. What King challenges us is to begin to look at when he enters the national stage and reassess what the Montgomery bus boycott was all about. Inasmuch as it inaugurated the formal civil rights struggles of the 50s and 60s, there was also an economic dimension. Not only a boycott of a bus line, but an economic organization of a community, such that beauticians, such that small property owners, such that individual, ordinary citizens like you and I began to challenge what seemed to be an insurmountable economic struggle, economic obstacle. And yes, they stood together for over one year, and eventually they achieved their goals. King did not have to move radically after 1965 to embrace a critique of capitalist political economy. It was something he knew intimately as an individual within, living in the South. It was something he recognized when he looked at not only the inequities between rich and poor, but he felt the stinging blow of racism and realized that African Americans are not at the bottom of the economic ladder by accident, but by historical reasons and rationale. 
I think when we look at King in 1968, standing arm in arm with the Memphis sanitation workers, it is the culmination of where King began his career. It is to begin to challenge those three evils of militarism, racism, and materialism. And if we begin to think with King today, we still face those challenges. And King recognized that it's not only national, but it's international. So when he visited Ghana on their Independence Day in 1957, he sat with Kwame Nkrumah and recognized that economic inequality is not only a national phenomena, it is a global phenomena. Sitting with CLR James on his way back to the US, he recognized that there need to be a structural uh, analysis of economic inequality. King recognized that we can't be who we are until the entire world has a chance to be who they are. In many ways, we find ourselves with Vincent Harding, wondering, is King safely dead? Perhaps we should recall him and see. And in the process, we may begin again to learn how to live. That's the challenge of King. And that's the challenge for, that King presents to our economic society. Professor Walker, today many activists, clergy, and politicians speak about economic empowerment for all, and they posit that they are within the Kingian tradition of social justice. What, if any, core King values do you believe that these folks get right, and what values do you think they misappropriate? There are a number of individuals who are working for economic justice throughout this nation and throughout this world. The first principle that they get right is that there's something dreadfully wrong with our economic system. We should not have a system whereby we're reaching economic inequality levels that rival and surpass those of the 1920s. We should not have an economic uh, system whereby individuals cannot live in many ways, what Alan Greenspan said in 1996 about the traumatized worker, King would recognize all too readily. Those individuals working to rectify this situation are correct, and they are principled in their stand. But they have to realize that our short-term processes and our short-term strategies should not take us off the long-term goal. And that is the development of an alternative economic system that values the human dignity of each and every individual. In many ways, King would challenge a living wage with his notion of a living income. King would challenge the idea that we have to work so many hours just to make enough to live by, to survive on. And King would move the goal from survival to human flourishing. Our short-term strategies, our short-term tactics, must be in alignment with our long-term visions and our long-term goals. King would not say, well, that's too far off, or that's uh, not, uh, not a, we can't meet that, those challenges. Instead, King would say, the infinite possibility that's available within our human enterprise is available to us if we act collectively to transform our system. In the midst of despair, in the midst of struggle, King would offer us a vision of hope. And that hope will catalyze the ways in which we envision new economic arrangements, alternatives for encouraging ourselves to be in collaboration with our neighbors, but more importantly, to see the global dimension of our economic situation and realize that we can't just do it here within New York City or in Norfolk, Virginia, where I'm from, but we have to do it not only in those spaces, but in connection with our other brothers and sisters throughout the globe. Panelists. That's the challenge. Sacrifice and the philosophical, ethical, and, and um, cultural significance of King to me is his ability to see all of that, keep his eye on all of that, but create a consciousness that gives us the will to go on. Because really, why bother? 
right? I mean, there's, there is this, this question underneath it all, which is what is going to give us the worldview that enables the kind of sustained action, commitment, empathy, compassion, and outrage that we actually need? The facts alone won't do that. And so I see his worldview there as both um, you know, hard to hold on to for the very same reason, but I think he already knew that. Um, and I think that's what we have to figure out, that that's not a naive moment. That's actually a, a very a sophisticated moment, the recognition of what we need to make it through. So let me throw at you as a follow-up, Dr. Rose, another King quote. This is from 1967, his Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? Mm -hmm. And he said, and I'm going to put an ellipse in the middle of this to read just part of it, the curse of poverty has no justification in our age. It is socially as cruel and blind as the practice of cannibalism at the dawn of civilization when men ate each other because they had not yet learned to take food from the soil or consume the abundant animal life around them. The time has come for us to civilize ourselves by the total, direct, an immediate abolition of poverty. Mm -hmm. Nobody talks in those terms mm -hmm. today. It's rather remarkable. There's been a real triumph of this notion that your behavior determines your station in life. Despite extraordinary evidence to the contrary that wealth is passed on by generations, that the 10 to 1 wealth gap, which is what we have racially, whites have 10 times the accumulated wealth that blacks do. That's centuries of accumulation that will not be changed, uh, really, except through this extraordinary social change. Um, but but the, the fact that somehow behavior is why people are where they are has become a, a real, I'm hoping, temporary triumph, to borrow <laughs> some of King's optimism. But, but what that does is it allows poverty to become a sort of much. Okay. Now we're moving to the fourth and unfortunately final topic, King as a cultural critic. My third reason for speaking out against Vietnam moves to an even deeper level of awareness, for it grows out of my experience in the ghettos of the North over the last three years, especially the last three summers, as I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men I have told them that Molotov cocktails, rifles, would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they asked, what about Vietnam? They asked if our nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the changes it wanted. Their questions hit home. And I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. For the sake of those boys, for the sake of this government, for the sake of the hundreds of thousands trembling under our violence, I cannot be silent. Professor Rose. Today, it seems that most cultural critics are individuals who illuminate scripted success in terms that um, require a, a focus on that violence. And I think in, in our contemporary culture, we've really seen a, a rather extraordinary marriage of those things. Um, the ways in which violent black masculinity is virtually the only cultural product um, that has been successfully for sale um, in, in, in black popular culture for the past eight or nine years. And, and the idea that 
the idea that that violence is somehow innately black, um, the projection of it onto black people is an incredible extension of what he's talking about in this quote about Vietnam and fears about ghetto uprising. The responding generational quote is, whatever, nigga. You know, it's irreverent, it's exhilarating, it's terrifying, and it's something we have to ask ourselves. What have we done to make a whole generation of young people think that that level of cynicism will create black community and social justice in the world? That's the kind of cultural criticism we need to be asking about. Thank to you. To build on that point, Professor Lewis. Do you believe that you see any kind of progressive leaning in uh, folks like Aaron Magruder and other folks who have? Well, if you're not primarily interested in fame, fortune, and immediate excessive wealth beyond your wildest dreams, but a sustainable existence. And I, that's not to say that I'm, 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 I, it's not about blame. Too much of our public conversation is either blame or complete excuse making. And I'm really trying to get away from both of those, but to say this is the environment that we're operating in, but we need a progressive challenge to it, not just a, it is what it is and that's all we have. Because I'm, I'm not sure I believe that, actually. I think, I think there are other things that, that are possible and that are going on. It's all about what your value system is, which is why he was so invested in a consciousness and an attitude and approach that helps you make the decisions that prevent this condition that I think we have now. Let's go upstairs. Who do we have up there? Hi, thank you. My name is Matthew Foglino, and I'm a teacher in the Bronx. Um, today we're here examining the legacy of Dr. King as a radical, somebody who was willing to challenge the foundations of society in order to produ produce substantive change. Today I also see a lot of longing for such change that King brought about, and I think we've articulated that well today. Now, there is with King, there were a lot of preconditions for him to emerge as the successful figure that he was. Uh, first off, the problems of race. Obviously, some people want to talk about nonviolence, and I think we're going to have to have some hard conversations. No, none of us really know where King would stand on some of the exact issues. The pro life movement appropriates Martin Luther. The call is stormy Monday. Tuesday's just as bad. They call it Stormy Monday, but Tuesday's just as bad. Wednesday is worse. Uh, this afternoon, we've heard a lot about flawed morals. Way over time, we're going to end in a minute with a poem. I'm curious, how many of you here today heard words of Dr. King that you had never heard before? It's an indication to me of how worthy this holiday is and how much it will have legs going to the future if people choose to use it in that way, not to quote the same three lines, but to continue to explore the rich legacy, what really reads as a canon with the ability to inspire that it has of the many words of Martin Luther King. Um, just some housekeeping on my WNYC radio show tomorrow. We will play excerpts from today's event. If you want to hear bits and pieces on the radio, if you want to hear the whole thing or even see it, because there, there is a video of this being made. Um, it will be on our website in a few days, wnyc.org, also on civicframe.org. And we thank Civic Frame, the Brooklyn Museum, poet Danny Simmons, who's available, whose book is available in the Brooklyn Museum bookstore, to be clear about that, and all our panelists. And April, you have a word. Thank you. It is our hope that you gained a richer, more nuanced understanding of the legacy of Dr. King today, that something that you heard today will inspire you to act, to tell something to someone else that you never heard before, to share what you learned today, to meet somebody today that you've never met before, and have a greater conversation about what you've heard and to build coalitions around this. We thank all of our amazing panelists. Give them a hand, please. 
Patricia Rose from Brown University, Corey D.B. Walker from Brown University, Patricia Williams from Columbia University, and Eric Sean Gregory from Princeton University. And I'll tell you, there are a couple of New Englanders here who would really like to know the Patriots does score. Does anybody know? <laughs> For real, does anybody know? Can I turn my cell phone on, on wait, now? Hold on, wait, wait, hold up, what? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, okay. <laughs> I'm better now. I'd also like to thank my wonderful and seasoned co-moderator. We really did just meet each other. <laughs> So it was my pleasure to work with you, and hopefully we'll do this sometime soon. I hope so, April. You're great. great. And most importantly, we encourage you and implore you and beg you to continue to support the great work of the Brooklyn Museum, of WNYC, and Civic Frame. And now I have the great pleasure of introducing you to Lisa Jesse Peterson. Listen. Good afternoon. This piece is called American Keloids. It's part of a larger piece from a one woman show that I've written entitled The Peculiar Patriot, which addresses the prison industrial complex system as it relates to love navigating between barbed wire to stay connected. <clears throat> we be American keloids, battle scarred and beautiful, ghetto butterflies earn their stripes, walk through the valley of colossal contempt, shadow boxing in puddles of tears, dodging bullets seen and unseen, Survivor, ain't no TV show. Shorties be wildin', surviving sins of the father, mama too. Shit is thick, yo. Wayward warriors journeying through war-torn wombs while American landmines await his, her, my, our arrival with 41 bullet gun salutes and precinct plunger butt parties. How can we heal when we're still under attack? Guilty for being gift wrap Latino and black. Jungle jigger, jungle boo. Attack against unnatural habitats. Now see, that's how we're supposed to do. But sometimes the science of the cage flip triggers misdirected rage, causing us to hurt the closest ones, the easiest ones, the innocent ones, the children. We hurt our sons and daughters, bury them in real neglect and false images. Another wake. I'm running out of flowers. Better catch the seeds, save the seeds, plant the seeds in love, in black earth toil, tobacco roads, cotton sugar cane, blessed blood industry, plantation economy, the next, the new, the now, prison industry, a war, a war, a war, and terrorism again. God damn it. The trees, remember, never forgot who shot us, hung us, Tuskegee experimented us, chemical warfare us, crack bombed us, four little girls praying in Alabama, terrorism and 911 is so layered, this axis of evil thing. Gypsy thugs, prison prophets, and corner store bodega intelligence say, this ain't nothing but a crumbling Barnum and Bailey sideshow experiment, mommy. A project with roaches cracking television, ringmasters hustling chaos, pimping poverty, placing bets on complacency, rewarding keepers of the status quo. Current culture celebrates the killer and the hoe. The children are watching. They already know that women is bitches, niggas ain't shit, money is God. This ain't normal, y'all. Broken dreams cut the baby's feet and hands in abandoned lots. Our sons cocked a glock. Our fathers fled. Where are the heroes, strangers in our mother's bed? Seeds grow and want and need. Love, 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 love. 
but she don't even love herself. That's a long story. Throwing her children to the wind. ACS, state agencies catch the fallen prey. Confusion every day. Shorty's face is slashed, scarred. We, the American keloids, rising mountains of pain beneath the skin. It is stretching my skin across ancient dynasty drums. I gotta keep the faith. I gotta keep the faith. I gotta keep the faith, cause even in the face of death, we still create life. We still create genius, like soundtracks for the planet. Blues, jazz, rock, we morphed into hip hop. We got that dominating flavor. We are walking, talking miracles. We are wounded, we are gorgeous, and we are in your face. Thank you. Can we have Danny Simmons come up one more time? Lisa, come on back for just a second. Can we have actor Thaddeus Daniels come out? Are Thaddeus and Danny still here? We thank Thaddeus, we thank Danny, we thank Lisa, even if we can't find them. Lisa, come on back. And we thank you all again. Thank you, have a great night.